Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Really honored and thrilled to have you here. Stumbled across your TikTok like many, many others. Said to myself, wow, this guy says all the things that I say in my own head. So I think we'll get along and uh, I'm grateful for you coming on the podcast here today. I appreciate that intro, Danny. Yeah, I'm super excited to be on, super excited for the conversation. Thank you so much for having me. I'm um, looking forward to it. Yeah, so I figured a good place to start would be with The Power of Now. And you read The Power of Now three times. And I just want to kind of set the scene for what drew you into The Power of Now. And like, why was that a book that even crossed your radar? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a funny story that I don't know if I've ever told before, but um, yeah, the, the Power of Now is sort of the first spiritual related book that got me interested in recognizing that the present moment is the only thing there ever is. And since then, my perspective has not shifted, but just deepened into that recognition of the present moment going from like this concept to the recognition that it is literally the root of our experience is the root of what I am as everything. But I don't know if you're familiar with Kino Body or Greg O'Gallagher, yeah. but I was, I was like big into his stuff uh, towards the end of college. So like 2017, 2018 ish. And he was reading it and, and talking about Power of Now and Eckhart Tolle and all of that. And so he, like, I have to give him credit for wow starting me on this sort of path because that was the first time I ever came across Eckhart Tolle and the power of now and all of that. And so, yeah, seeing him talk about it and, and it definitely resonated and things that he was referencing from the book, uh, what Greg was referencing. And then, yeah, I, I uh, got it. And it was the first one I read in that sort of realm and just resonated. And it really wasn't even until it was interesting because the first time I read it, it was like, didn't really understand anything about it. Like I was so far from the the state I live in now that it was like, like state of being that I live in now that it was like so foreign. And the second time started to resonate a little third time it clicked conceptually. And it wasn't until like even just a year ago that it clicked like in the way, like a very, very much deeper way. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I give a lot of credit to Power of Now for just getting me started on this whole journey. It's so cool because I read The Power of Now in college and I read it like probably the first chapter and I remember like almost going to sleep while reading it. Like I just couldn't understand it. It was so boring to me. It didn't make any sense. And I read it again like, I don't know, three years later, four years later. I'm like, oh my God, there's so much here. And... So it, it just leads me to ask about your experience with the the third time. Like, what was, what were the things that you implemented as a result of reading the book? Yeah, it's a great question. I think so. For me, my my backstory with like mental health related things is it was especially in high school was like the sort of the worst of it when I was fifteen, sixteen, seventeen years old. Kind of when you know people start building up that sense of identity, sense of self start worrying about what people think of them. So I did that to an extreme to the point that I was super quiet in high school, like insanely quiet. Like anyone who knows me from high school knows that I was, you know, nice kid, cool guy, like played sports, but just like super quiet guy. And and so it wasn't this outward, outwardly obvious thing that I was struggling with because I was just quiet. It was like a lot of people are quiet in high school, but it was because it was rooted in the fear of people's perception of me and the way that it worked out in my mind, it's like, oh, well, if I just never put myself out there, never speak my mind, hardly speak at all. It's not that anyone's going to have a super positive perspective on me or perception of me, but they're also not going to have a super negative perception of me. And that was my only fear was like that someone would have a negative perception of me. So I just stayed very quiet and was always worrying about stuff that would happen in the future, basically just constantly afraid and nervous and worried. And so when I started reading The Power of Now, it was just the recognition like, oh, wow, I have existed for the past four years, like in my mind, mm -hmm. like everything about my reality has been rooted in my mind and my thoughts and perceptions about and fears about what people think of me and how I see the world is not actually 
seeing the reality of it here and now, which is all that it ever is, it's like stuck in my mind. So it kind of helped me to at least recognize that initially. And, you know, since then it's been quite a journey, but that was the initial recognition thing that it helped with a lot was just a recognition that right now is all there ever is. Yeah. When I was doing research for this podcast and looking at your story, I was just surprised to hear you mentioned the, the quiet piece of it, how you were a quiet person, because it seems like you're so confident in what you're talking about. It seems like you're so willing to share your perspective. What has been the reaction from the people who knew you back then to your content today? That's yeah, no, these are great questions. These are like different than a lot of the ones I get asked in a lot of podcasts, but, um, I think it's, it's funny cause I've actually gotten reached out to by some kids from high school who weren't necessarily my super close friends, but were kids I was like acquaintances with, and even some kids that wasn't like, I wasn't in like the top popular group necessarily in high school. I was like, it's funny even saying this, it's so fucking absurd to say this, but like <laughs> second, sort of like second tier where it was like, I, I knew all of them, whatever. But so like, since then, like I've had some reach out to me with like situations they're going through and be like, Hey man, like you got any, I really like your videos. Like you got any advice for this thing I'm going through. And so it's fascinating to see that, um, in terms of like high school friends, I only keep in touch with like three or four really, um, commonly like regularly. Um, so there isn't a ton of necessarily interaction with those people. Um, but I have come across some and no one's really ever been like, dude, you're so different than you were in high school. Like a lot of them have actually just been like, dude, I love your stuff. Like I really enjoy your videos. So it's, it's like cool seeing that, but I just, just based on how I know that people describe me because they would say it to not necessarily to my face, but other people would describe me like that in high school. So I'm sure it's kind of like interesting that now I have a big social media following and, and sort of talk about this stuff and I'm very open and don't give a flying fuck what people think of me for the most part. Um, but yeah, so that's been, that's been cool to see and just, yeah, but I only keep in touch with a few, so I don't I don't necessarily have like a big group that's like, dude, Andrew, you've changed so much because I I've always kind of been open with the core that I have kept in touch with, so there probably has been less of a shift in their perspective. Yeah. No, that's cool. And from from doing research, I saw and noticed that you had this period where you were debating being a content creator, putting yourself out there in that respect. And you just kept meditating. And the thing that would pop over, over and over again, when you pictured your hundred year old self was putting out content. And like, why do you think for a year and a half or two years in your own words, that was coming up over and over and over again? I don't know. Honestly, it's interesting because I would have friends that I would talk to about you know, mindfulness stuff, meditation, nutrition, health, physical well-being, all of it. And I had a lot of thoughts about it. And I've always been super interested in, you know, researching different diet styles. I worked out since I was like 13. I played like every sport growing up. So that's been a huge part of it. And then since 2017, 2018, started getting more into meditation and just mindfulness practices and whatnot. So I had, I remember one situation where I had a couple of my friends from work, actually, I think it was probably 2018 or 2019. Be like, Andrew, you're so, it was after, I think I gave a presentation to my office about, I used to be really into intermittent fasting. I'm less so now as like an end all be all practice. I still utilize it here and there, but I straight up gave a full presentation on like how intermittent fasting is like the only way to eat to my <laughs> office at work. And so like it was after something like that. So my friends were like, Andrew, when are you going to become an influencer and like start posting on social media? And I was like, yeah, yeah, like probably never. We'll see. And so it did get bring brought up a few times and I still don't know though why it was like that thing when I would go through as part of my morning routine back, you know, a few years ago, I would imagine being old and wrinkly. I would imagine going through my life, like being 25, 30, 35, 40, and like imagine all of those stages. And then imagine being a hundred 
super old, wrinkly, and thinking back on my life and what I regret most. And as you mentioned, thing that kept came up every like every single day. So it was like 500 days in a row was like not creating content. And the reason that I wow. didn't was because I was afraid of how people were going to perceive me, how I was going to be judged. Like, would I even be good at it? I was insecure about my communication styles. Can I articulate things very well? Which is funny to say now because it's like the most of what I do is like articulate things, speak and all that stuff. But I had a lot of deeply rooted insecurities probably stemming from high school to a degree about those things. And then one day I was just like, fuck it. I, I know for a fact I'm going to regret this. And I know this is going to hurt more when I'm older, if I don't do this, than it will to receive any judgment from initially starting. So it's like, I felt like I just didn't have any other choice. And that's when I started. <laughs> was there a specific moment or a, a like an aha, or was it just like, yo, like this has been 500 days. Like I got to do this. Yeah. So yeah, it was actually a situation at work. Um, I had, as I mentioned, a lot of like just self-limiting beliefs that I wasn't a good communicator, wasn't a good speaker, wasn't able to articulate things well, wasn't super confident. And I was giving a call or uh, I would have a client calls every week. And my boss just as a practice for everyone to like, see, be able to look at their own performance on a call and see how they do, how to record the call. And so I got done with the call, it was recorded. And I was like, oh, that was typical. Like they asked some questions. I, I was kind of hesitant to answer, didn't always give great answers. This was in my head, what I was saying. And this was probably a week before I started posting content or a couple days before I started posting content. And I also didn't like the way my voice sounded. That was another insecurity that I had. So it was just like all of these things that are so opposite of like everything that I do now, which is so funny. But uh, so I listened back to the recording and I recognized that everything I thought to be true about myself wasn't actually true because I was able mm -hmm. to see it from a third person perspective and all of these things that I was so sure of, like, oh, you took like five seconds to answer that question was a split second. It was maybe half a second. It was like, oh, your voice doesn't sound as weird as you thought it did. And just being able to see that, like that was a, a big fear for me too. It was like how my voice would sound when I'm speaking in a video. And so that literally, that it was a boss. I didn't even like my boss at the time, but I am eternally grateful for her. Cause if I hadn't done that exercise, I may still have never posted any content. And it was like a couple days later after recognizing that all those things I thought to be so true about myself weren't actually true at all. And being able to see that I was like, all right, well, there's nothing stopping me anymore. So here we go. Yeah. I think a lot of people deal with those negative voices, those negative, negative chatter and that anxiety that comes into their head. What, where do you think that comes from? Uh, I think it comes from a lot of different places, depending on the person and the situation. Uh, it just, and I, I think it becomes a habit almost like throughout yeah. our lives. As we grow up after the age of 10, we start building up, you know, this identity, the story of what we think we are, what people tell us that we are, because, you know, everyone else has an identity and they're so sure of what they are, what they're good and bad at strengths and weaknesses, likes, dislikes, all of that. So that all plays into this, you know, egoic identity that, and this idea of ourselves that we have, not actually what we are, but what we think we are. And so it comes from a number of places, whether it's parents, friends, just a traumatic experience that you had that you just remember forever. Um, but yeah. So I think that's where it comes from. And then for me, what helps all the time is just recognizing that I don't know. I don't know mm. any of those things to be true. I don't know what I'm good or bad at. I am just experiencing this moment. And with that, there are no strengths and weaknesses. There are no likes and dislikes. There is only this experience that I am having now as experience, as existence, like this conversation that we, we have, it's, it's interesting. It's almost like shifting Alan Watts talks about this a little bit, but shifting your perspective of what action verbs are. So right now, either of us could say I am having a conversation and we think of it like I am this individual having a conversation, but when you shift it to, I am having a conversation, it's like, I am the act of having a conversation. Like this conversation would not be happening without us. And all of a sudden you're, you are 
that conversation. And it's always related to the here and now, what you're doing in that. So you don't need an identity going into it. And I think that is sort of the, the crux of this flow state that people call it. And I like to think of that like flow versus fear. It's like on the spectrum where fear is like, you're very, you have a concrete identity and a lot of things to lose. That's when you're afraid is when you think you are what you think you are. And then flow is when there isn't really any identity and you are just one with life, with the flow of life, with the action that you are doing without that idea of yourself in the way there's so much more freedom and so much more energy to be produced and that can be directed into the action. And that's what people call flow state when they're just, you know, forget the entire world, forget to eat, forget to, you know, do anything. They're just one with the practice. So uh, that went all over the place. I don't even remember what your initial question was, but <laughs> those are some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So you were talking about being in the here and now, being present, and that's like a core pillar, I would say, of what you talk about in general and what you've talked about in this conversation. And there was a time, though, I think it, you were in Utah, where you were talking about this on social media, being here, being present in the here and now, but that's what you were talking about. But what you were experiencing in life wasn't that. There was incongruency, and it caused you to call your parents cry on the phone and like talk to him about it. So take me through that conversation and making the realization that what you were talking about and what you were actually doing in your day to day weren't in alignment. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's goes into, I guess I've, I've, so like from a broader perspective with social media, like I've taken a handful of breaks just where it's gotten to be too much. And I'm just like, I got to take a week off, like cold Turkey, cut it out. And so that situation was, I think, winter between 2020, 2021, I think it was like probably four or five months after I started making content or six months after I started creating content, something like that. And I was just getting very, so before I go into that, I guess it's important to recognize that you're always present. Like you are always embodying the present moment. Even when you think you're not, like when we worry, we worry now. We may be worrying yeah. about something that we think isn't now, but it's happening now. So it's like, we're never not present. So to say, how do I become present is almost like, I sometimes don't even know how to answer it. It's like, what do you mean? Have you ever experienced anything else? Like, have you ever been <laughs> anywhere else that isn't here now? It's like, no. So it's just that recognition can help a lot that you're nowhere that isn't here now. Always even saying nowhere, if you space the W and the H, it's like now here. And so, but in that situation, um, I was just getting very caught up with social media and very focused on just posting videos all the time, being live all the time. I used to go live like 10 times a day. I was always on live, like anytime. Cause I, I saw, and I think it's less so now, but early on, like 2020, especially like if you went live, it would boost your videos like a ton. If I had a video doing kind of well, I would go on live and it would have like a hundred thousand more views in mm. 20 minutes. So I saw that and I was like, Oh fuck, well, why don't I just go live all the time? So I was constantly on live and just constantly doing things like that with the hopes to, you know, continue building my following. And I was so enthralled in trying to build that up that. I was missing my life. It wasn't mm -hmm. that, you know, you're always present. So it wasn't that I wasn't being present, but people understand what I'm saying. It's like, I was so caught up in that. And because these apps and platforms live on our phone, it's very difficult to separate, you know, your, your time on your phone from, you know, posting stuff and commenting back to people. And then like the rest of your life, because in order to comment on a video, it's like, I got to open up TikTok, and there's this algorithm that is the greatest algorithm ever created to try and suck in my attention. I have to somehow get through that and get to the comment section and like comment back to people. So it's, it's created to suck you in. So I almost yeah. think of it like going into what is it quicksand and then like having to run across quicksand to get to the comments so I can respond to people or like post a video or edit a video or anything 
So I, I just recognized, and I'm relatively self-aware enough, I guess, that I can recognize when I do start to get too caught up in it and see that, you know, the most important thing is my experience here and now. It's not building a following. It's like at the end of the day, you, you can build anything and everything in the world, make all the money in the world, and you're still here now. And that is the root of your experience and existence and being able to just have an appreciation for that and a recognition that this is life and you don't know how long you have to experience it or experience it as, you know, this character necessarily um, is important. So, yeah, when I get too caught up, I, I do take some time off. And every time I've taken time off, I've, I've gained more clarity into like being able to set more boundaries. So the longer I've gone, the less like cold Turkey breaks I have to take. And the more just like day to day, I'm like, all right, I'm turning my phone on airplane mode, putting it in another room, going to go do some other stuff for now. So hmm. what are some other times you've had to take breaks? Uh, it's, it's been a number, I don't know, probably a handful of times and they've all been sort of similar to that. Just getting too caught up in social media. Cause as I said, it's like, it lives on our phone. So it's like yeah. to be on my phone the whole time. I've never loved being on my phone before I started posting on social media regularly, like back in 2020, I used to delete any social media app for my phone, like once a month for like a mm. week just because it's like, I don't need to be on this all the time. And now because it's become sort of like part of my regular things that I do and having a platform and posting videos regularly, it's like, I'm not just going to take a week off every single month, but it's still something I, I just find to be important to keep in mind that, you know, life is always here now. And, and while being on social media and posting on social media, as long as you're doing it mindfully, isn't, there's nothing wrong with it. Like there's nothing bad about it, but there can be internal drivers and desires to like get away from it for a bit. And so I think it's important just to recognize them and to, you know, be able to take that time off here and there because it can be, you know, it can be a toxic thing. If you allow it to be, it's not inherently toxic. There's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it's just a good practice, another good practice to be able to stay mindful, similar to anything else that you're doing in your life. It's just another tool you can use to be a practice like that. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you talking about that because I feel like it's not really talked about a lot, taking breaks for content creators in general. So I, I'm really appreciative of that. Kind of switching gears here, I want to talk about your heroes. I feel like the best way to get to know somebody, who they value, and what they value is to look at who are the people they view as heroes. So when I ask that question, who comes to mind for you? Ooh, yeah, I have a few that come to mind. I mean, my parents, I've always had a very close relationship with them. And they're someone that are two people that I've always been able to be open with about. And like, we definitely butt heads about certain things. There's certain things I post about, you know, they're not super public people, you know, whereas my persona now, and like, I am very open about things and have no issue with it. So, you know, there are times where they see me as like a reflection of them. And so they, they sort of tie those things together. And I'm like, I am, you know, while I am you technically, <laughs> you know, I am not you, my experience <laughs> is not reflective of you. If anything, you know, majority of the stuff. And sometimes it, when I post about, you know, religion or drugs or mushrooms or whatever, it can be, uh, just get dicey. And it's like, why don't you look at the other 95% of my videos and the people that they help and just like focus on that and let me focus on <laughs> this stuff. But anyway, uh, definitely my parents, um, the guy I do the podcast with Ray, uh, part of dual Unity, which is my podcast. Um, he's the co-host. He lives in Vancouver Island, Canada. Uh, it's like 40, I think he's 43. Uh, but he had recognition similar to what I have, like that I am the awareness of existence here and now, and I am everything and everyone. Uh, he recognized that like 20 years ago and he stayed relatively quiet, but just a year ago started posting on social media. We connected 
um, resonated with each other a lot and started this podcast. So he is someone I definitely look up to just being able to see ourselves in each other so clearly uh, between the two of us is pretty cool. So being able to uh, talk to him about different difficulties with that recognition in a society that doesn't necessarily recognize that and feel so separate um, has been super helpful for me. And then like public personas, probably Jim Carrey. Um, I don't know if you've seen some of his interviews where people like call him crazy. Cause he's like, there is no me. Like I am you, there's just energy here. Like I, I am beyond any sort of personality. It's like, I, I fucking love that stuff. And he just is clearly someone who's recognized that. And especially as someone who's been so famous as famous as he has been. And even just his quote saying like, I wish everyone could realize all of their hopes and dreams, all of their fames and fortunes to realize that that's not the answer. It's like, there's very few people who have gone to that extent of fame and fortune that he has and been able to recognize that, oh, this isn't what it is. All that it is, is like here and now that's kind of the pinnacle. Um, and then the last person is probably Alan Watts. I think he's my favorite philosopher. Um, he, I just always read, well, more recently have resonated with him. I think a few years ago, uh, I, I didn't really understand what he was talking about. Like it was very difficult to see or, or for me to recognize what he was talking about, but now I very clearly do. Um, so yeah, Alan Watts is, is someone I, I love listening to. And while I don't listen to a ton of stuff or read a ton of stuff at the moment, uh, every once in a while I'll toss on like an Alan Watts speech or something. I love it. Those are four great ones or five with your parents. Um, I want to touch on a piece of this that you mentioned, which is the idea that society as a whole doesn't view the world as the way that you are believing it to be and the difference between that. And if it causes you any level of just anxiety or like, like, what's going on here? Like I believe, or I know, or I experience the world like this and the world is not the society that we live in is not set up to believe this often. How do yeah. you deal with that difference? Um, yeah. So just touching on that whole idea of like this being this experience being an illusion of duality, like an illusion of separateness, but not literal separation. That's like the reason for the title of our podcast, dualistic unity, like a dualistic experience as unity, which is the, the reality of it. Like we are not any different. We all, we all identify as I and me, you know, like I am Andrew, I am Danny. And it's not that we are Andrew or Danny, it's we are the I, and it's the same I across the entire universe. And when you are able to see beyond the identity that you've built, you know, like that ego character that everyone builds up as a teenager, pretty much that I mentioned earlier, when you see that, you know, you're not your name, you're not your past, you're none of those things that you think that you are, you're not your strengths and weaknesses. It's like, as you peel those back and break those down and begin to question everything that you thought you were, you see that, oh, you are just existence here and now you are just experiencing what is here and now, no names, no labels, nothing like that. And through that, you, I don't know, can more clearly see that you're, you're everything and everyone here and now as the here and now. But I think it's a really good illusion. Like it's a really fucking strong illusion is what it comes down to. And it's not like, I don't discount that at all. And I still, the thing is too, is it's not this thing that I, recognize a hundred percent of the time. Like I absolutely mm. get caught up in forgetting that I am not what I think I am. I get caught up in because ego. So I'll say this too, like when it comes to ego and like the idea of identity, it's not a bad thing. Like ego is not people. So many people are like, Oh, I need to kill my ego. I need to have an ego death, blah, blah, blah. But it's like ego is just your ticket to experience. It is, your ability to perceive yourself or, or identify as something that is separate from someone else. And although that may not be the truth, 
it is imperative in order for us to communicate. And for convenience sake, it's way easier to have names. So, you know, someone sees us in a crowd and they're like, hey, you, if we didn't have names, they'd have to say, hey, you, the whole crowd turns around. So it's like, yeah. that's where the names come from. That's why it's, it's great that we have names, but it's not the truth. We get lost in thinking that that's actually what we are. And that's the reality of what we are. So in terms of like, finally coming back to your question, like, how is it recognizing this when everyone around me feels like they don't or thinks, you know, it's just a shift in what you think you are or, or what you recognize that you are not is what it comes down to in a lot of ways. So the shift is just thinking that you're just this idea of what you think you are to recognizing that you're not. And if you're not what you think you are and you're not bounded to this identity, all of a sudden your identity has no bounds. It's like a pool without walls or a pool without borders. And in that identity exists everything here and now, like a massive, an analogy I like to use is, is reality is like a massive tapestry that is only here and now. It's kind of like here and now moving. It's like a sideways tapestry kind of, we perceive it in different increments, but we're always perceiving right now. And every one and everything is a thread in that tapestry. So the shift is from thinking that you're the thread that is separate from all the other threads. And there's some distinct separation that is factual, that you are different or divided from that tapestry to recognizing that this thread is the tapestry. The tapestry would not be without the threads. If there were no threads, there would be no tapestry. So you are the tapestry. It's not that you're a part of the tapestry, but you're it, you're the entire tapestry. And as you change, one thread changes, the entire tapestry is now changed. If it was a red tapestry, for example, and one of the threads changed to blue, that whole tapestry now looks different. It's not just that the one thread is different. So as we change, the entire world changes. And those are just some recognitions that you can more clearly see when you stop defining yourself as this story. And essentially a lot of it comes down to your past. So in that recognition, there aren't bounds to what you are anymore. And you see yourself as this boundless entity that has influence here and now, not control because that's outcome based, but influence over the experience here and now. And that influence impacts everything. And, you know, if, if we are impacting our environment and our environment is impacting us no differently, it brings into question, where do you end and where does your environment begin? Or is there no division? whatsoever. So I guess just recognizing that and seeing that seeing myself in everyone brings about a lot of empathy. So even if someone doesn't recognize this, it's like, I see that if I had the same experiences as they did, and I had the same upbringing and everything, I wouldn't recognize it either. So there's nothing right or wrong mm -hmm. with either one. There's nothing good or bad in either recognition, but it just has brought about a lot more empathy, like true empathy, being able to see that you know, I would exact act exactly as someone else would if I were them because I am with their experiences. Mm. One thing that came up for me while you're just talking is how we view nature often as something separate. Nature is out there. Nature is the forest or the beach, but like we're part of nature too. We are nature. And I think that realization was really important for me because I realized like there's no separation. We put up a house, but there's really no separation between what we're looking at on the trees and the beaches and animals and what we are. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, I think that's a huge part. Actually, that's a great point to bring up because we think of humans as because we have the ability to be self-aware and have like self-consciousness and idea of ourselves. We've gotten, you know, confused into thinking that idea of ourselves is what we are. But when you see that you are just, you are nature no differently than the trees or the birds or the stream. And it actually, I actually have a, uh, Alan Watts quote that I have as my background and it's very That's much good. related to this. So I'm just going to read it. Um, he says, what I am really saying is that you don't need to do anything because if you see yourself in the correct way, you are all as much extraordinary phenomenon of nature as trees, 
clouds, the patterns in running water, the flickering of fire, the arrangement of the stars, and the form of the galaxy. You are all just like that, and there is nothing wrong with you at all. So that's kind of tied into the recognition that we are no different than a flame, running water, trees, billowing, being impacted by the wind, you know, they're moving. Like we are that and we are no different. We just think that we are. And we think of human beings as this totally separate thing that like a lot of people, and it's rooted in a lot of different beliefs that we, you know, came to earth as opposed to came from the earth as, you know, through evolution and started as single cell organisms, multi cell organisms, and uh, whatever, whatever, ever, you know, whatever our shared ancestor with the apes was to, you know, now humans and, and experiencing it now, but we discount everything leading up to what we look like and experience now and think of it as just like, oh, this is, you know, something totally separate. And it's like, we came from the earth. And in that recognition that we are nature, there's, it, it becomes, it starts to break down those beliefs and barriers as to, you know, thinking that you're separate from everyone else or everything else on earth. Yeah. It's powerful insight. And if you really sit with it and meditate on it, you, you come to a really interesting conclusion of, of just love and appreciation for what we are and what you're looking at, which is way different than thinking everything separate. And it's like, what I like to think about is, is choosing your beliefs. And even if they're incorrect, which one is serving you the most, right? This view that we're having, and I agree with you of like every, everything is one, like at its deepest sense. And let's say that's not true. Like say, say that's a hundred percent false in, in a reality, in this reality, I act better to human beings. I act better to myself. I act better to the things that I come across when I believe that to be true. So it's almost like thinking like, what are the beliefs that actually serve you? And can you believe those more? Yeah, I, I absolutely feel you. And I think that's an awesome perspective to have. What I will say about that recognition is that it comes, it's almost like rooted, not in belief, but in questioning what you believe everything else to be and what you think you are, like everything you believe in takes you away from the recognition that you are everything. Because if you believe you are this or that, or in this, you know, sort of system or whatever, it, it, it's inherently divisive in a way. Yeah. Whereas, you know, I, I don't really have any beliefs. It's like when someone's like, cause I think in our society too, we're so identified and we're so caught up in different belief systems that we think that, oh, not having, not having any beliefs is a belief. And it's like, no, that's not actually how it works. Like if you don't have beliefs, like all I ever say is I am here now, I am here now. That's not a belief that is the crux and root of my experience. I am some, sem it's not that I am Andrew. Andrew's just a name that my parents gave this grouping of cells. I am just some semblance of awareness of this moment here and now. That's kind of it. And in that recognition, there's a ton of depth because there isn't anything separating me from experience or anything else. And so a lot of what we talk about, like on my podcast is just the questioning of everything. Like we literally question everything and have basically questioned ourselves into oblivion to recognize that we're never what we think we are or things you know, beliefs are rooted in the mind and rooted in thoughts for the most part, like believing in something that you cannot see. If you couldn't use your imagination or you couldn't think, what are you believing in besides that you are here and now? And so that's kind of been my barometer for any sort of belief system is like, would this be true? Would you be able to believe in this if you couldn't use your thoughts and you couldn't use your imagination. And you couldn't like, use your thoughts it, though. Like then would you have any, what would be going through your brain if you didn't have any thoughts, your experience here and now, would it though? 
Have you ever been able to stop thinking? I mean, I, I have, there's yeah, a lot of times yeah, where I'm, where I'm yeah. not thinking and I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing, I'm still experiencing right now. Thoughts aren't required for being or experience. So the, the whole quote, like, I, I think, I think therefore I am is, I don't know exactly if like they meant to say, I forget who said it, but like they meant it to be exactly as it came off, but it sounds like they thought that thinking was required for being. And it's very much right, right. not the case. It's like being is what is no thoughts necessary. And without thoughts, there aren't, you can't really believe in anything else. And it's very much tied into things like fear and worry, anxiety, and a lot of our suffering exists inside right. of our mind exists due to our thoughts about the way things are, or the way things we think things should be. It's all rooted in mind and thought. So as you begin to question what you think you are and what you think the world is and recognize that your thoughts are not the truth, like existence just is your thoughts and opinions are not necessary about it or yourself. You start to see that, oh, things just are, and things are pretty cool. Like reality is pretty crazy. Life's pretty nuts. Earth's pretty wild. And you know, that's something that psychedelic substances can potentially help with is they quiet your mind a little bit so you can just recognize and appreciate your experience that you're having here and now. And that's how it, it can potentially help people with, you know, depression and anxiety related uh, issues. I'm not recommending it to anyone. I'm just saying like that is something that has, you know, helped people with that in the past. <laughs> yeah. I, it makes me think of meditation and when you meditate, when I meditate and I, feel most peace. It's often when no thoughts are actually occurring and what a beautiful place that is to operate from and a beautiful place to, to realize like why, why do that feels so good when you're not thinking thoughts because you're in the present moment, like you're feeling the present moment. Is that correct? Like, well, what would you say? Yeah, I, I would, I would say that there isn't, I think many of us exist with a lot of judgments and perceptions about the way that things are, the way that other people are, the way that we are, you know, yeah. limiting beliefs about yourself, whatever. And when you recognize that you don't have to take your thoughts so seriously and you begin to question them and see that, oh, this is, this is the reason that I've been suffering so much is because I, I think that my thoughts are the truth. And as you start to see that they're not and start to question everything that comes up that you believe to be true, start to see, oh, I don't have to take that so seriously. And then all that's left is right now beyond the distortion of your thoughts and perceptions and judgments about the way that you think things are or the way you think things should be. Everything just is in a sort of neutrality. And in that there's a lot of, of beauty and you're able to appreciate things for what they are rather than for what you perceive them to be, which is never what they are. So you talk about doing mushrooms. You've talked about it a little bit here and <laughs> you talked about the issue with your parents and, um, but it was funny when I was doing research for this and seeing that you actually hadn't done mushrooms up to a certain point and you were speaking as if you had done it. People were assuming, oh, this guy has definitely done mushrooms. What? was that experience like? And then like, how many times have you done it since? And take me through that. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, so I sort of recognize that I'm not what I think I am, uh, back in July of last year, July of 2021. Um, I was going through, I'll just give like a tiny bit of backstory on this and then get into the mushrooms. Cause this is kind of what led to me recognizing all of this. I was, I was having just like a tough week of a lot of intrusive thoughts, a lot of worry about, different personal things going on in my life. And it was like a full six days. And I was going through everything, every identity based practice that has ever helped me get through random stuff. And so I was going through, you know, meditation, gratitude, affirmations, anything and everything I could try and nothing was really working. And it wasn't until one day, it was like six days after I was going through all this shit, was 
I was actually listening to one of Eckhart Tolle's audiobooks, uh, Stillness Speaks. It's one of the shorter ones. And there's a part that I'd heard many times before I had talked about, and it was just about how the past doesn't actually exist. And it just, for some reason in that moment, hit me so much harder than anything had ever before. And it was because everything I was worrying about were things that happened in my past that I was worrying about, you know, happening again in the future. And so I imagined for a second, I was able to take a second and imagine that I didn't actually have a past, that I had no past whatsoever. And all I was, was aware of my surroundings, my experience. I was walking through New York City around Ma uh, Madison Square Park and just like, wow, you know, without this past, things feels pretty good. Like this feels pretty fucking great. Like I feel very light right now because I'm not getting weighed down by my past. And so I went a little bit deeper into that. I was like, wait a second, you know, if I'm, if I don't actually have a past in, in reality, then am I Andrew? Cause is Andrew nothing more than everything leading up to right now than everything leading up to this moment here and now. But if I am just the awareness of existence here and now, then maybe I'm not Andrew, because Andrew's just this, all the past, you know, all these things I've accomplished, these things I've done, the idea that people have about me based on my past. But if I'm not my past and I'm just right now, then maybe I'm not Andrew. And that just blew my mind. And for a week straight, it was like from going through all that shitty intrusive thoughts to like, I felt like I was high for a week. There was just like, because my idea of self, my identity had just been shed. And without that, it was just like freedom awareness of existence here and now. And for like two weeks, the only videos I ever posted were like related to that insight. And so I was talking about that all the time. Like I am not Andrew. I, and I got, I came to like, I am just the present awareness of Andrew. And I kind of got, it was almost like I got stuck on that a little, cause that was still kind of egotistical, still sort of separate from the recognition that I am everything because I was limiting to the idea of Andrew, but Andrew doesn't actually exist. So I'm just the awareness of everything here and now and the universe experiencing itself in that way. So I started talking about that stuff and, and people were commenting things on my videos like, oh, tell me you've done psychedelics without telling me you've done psychedelics, you know, those types of TikTok comments. And it was, everyone was like, oh, this dude is cripping so hard right now. And I would comment like, I've actually never done any psychedelic ever. I've never done mushrooms, never done anything. And so then I was like, I started looking into microdosing and it was kind of getting me interested in, in that. I came across someone who was selling them, got connected with them. And uh, yeah, so that was in July that I had that recognition. And then it was like towards the end of September, I tried them for the first time. And uh, Ray, the guy I do the podcast with, we started that end of September. Um, I, I didn't try mushrooms until like October. So it was like, I remember a few episodes into the podcast when I started when I talked about my experience. Um, and so he had done them a bunch in the past and had a lot of experience. So I was like talking to him about what to expect, what to, you know, look out for. So I had people around me that were able to talk through it with me. And I think that's a super important part of, of trying them for the first time. So yeah. And then I tried them for the first time and it was kind of like recognized more. It was like, I was able to more clearly see what I had already seen in a way. And I started with a little bit of microdosing and then I tried a higher dose and it was, yeah, there was, I had a lot of very interesting experiences and I actually did them like quite a bit in the fall. And then I sort of realized I, I got up to, I think part of me just wanted to try, it's called the heroic dose. It's five grams. And part of me was just like, I want to get there. So I kind of like worked my way up to that and then tried that. And it was quite the experience. And then I was like, all right, I, I don't, I, I felt so much like I was on a microdose just in my regular day-to-day -day sober life because I had so much I less identity coming with me that I was like, I don't need to take the like microdose regularly or, or trip that often. And so since January, I think I've tripped maybe, maybe twice. Um, but it, it's way less frequent because I just feel, I literally feel similarly to the way that I did on my first microdose. Now when I'm 
sober. So um, that's sort of some backstory on that. I can talk a little bit about mushrooms and like my thoughts on them and how they actually impact your idea of identity and how it actually is very much interrelated to the stuff I was talking about earlier about like Please. identity and, and being weighed down. But okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love, I, I, I love, just love it, talking about this stuff in general, but uh, yeah, love, love chatting about mushrooms. So I think an analogy I use is that everyone exists because so everyone has this idea of, of mushrooms and most people have this very deep rooted stigma based on, you know, the government making them illegal and, you know, it fries your brain and all this crazy shit. And the main reason for the war on drugs, at least from my understanding is like, I think was it the Vietnam war was going on around that, around that time, they like needed people to go to war. So the government was like, all these people are like, don't care about war at all. And they just want to be like loving and, and happy all the time. We need people, some people to go to war for us. So we got to ban these drugs. And they were made uh, schedule one drugs, which means that there is zero benefit to them whatsoever, uh, which is absolutely absurd because every psychedelic has some benefit, especially something like mushrooms. As, and plus that comes from the earth. It's like, there's there, I don't know. I feel like there should be less of a stigma for something that comes from the earth for to being like banned as a schedule one substance. It's just absolutely absurd in my mind, but, um, there are, cause there are obviously benefits and those are coming out more and more like Canada made mushroom psilocybin, um, medically legal, uh, like a couple months ago, which is like a big step in the right direction. But, uh, the way I like to describe them and as they relate to identity is, and how they can be helpful to people who are very staunch in their beliefs about the world around them or, or themselves, um, is that everyone sort of lives with a certain amount of layers. And I think of these layers as like judgments and perceptions about maybe it's about the world and how it's like, you know, this terrible place or whatever, or perceptions about yourself. Like, oh, I am this type of person. I have this strength, this weakness, blah, 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 blah. And, and a lot of people who are very set in their ways and not super open-minded might have like 20 layers. Whereas someone, you know, like me or you, maybe we aren't as set in our ways, a little bit more open-minded. Maybe we only have like 15 layers. Regardless, everyone has a certain amount of layers. And as you question them just naturally in your sober existence, that you can start to peel back more and feel a little bit more free. But I think mushrooms can help accelerate that process. And so I think of it like the more you take, the more peel back that you feel mm. and the more easily you're able to see that things just are. And as you see that things just are with like sort of in neutrality, no no good or bad things just are what they are. You see that, you know, the earth is this pretty incredibly beautiful place and existence and your experience may not be as terrible as you think it is because a lot of our suffering exists inside of our mind. So they, they help you see this because they help to quiet your mind. They actually down regulate the, uh, I think it's the DNS default, or something. Default mode default, network. Yes. DMN. Default yeah. mode network. DMN. Yes, absolutely. So it down regulates that, which is what constitutes your sort of ego, your sense of self. So you feel a lot less self-conscious and when you don't have as much of a sense of self, because that is where all of your intrusive thoughts come from. Like how many intrusive thoughts do people have that don't have to do with their idea of themselves? Because that's what they identify as. So that's what they're trying to defend all the time. And, and the intrusive thoughts for the most part are just trying to like in a convoluted way, make them feel more safe or secure, which it doesn't really work as well anymore. It's, it usually just causes all this suffering, but mushrooms help down regulate your default mode network. So you have less sense of self and without the veil of identity, the veil of sense of self, as that gets sort of peeled back, you can just see things for what they are without as many judgments and perceptions or layers, as I like to call them, as you usually live by. So it's actually very interconnected with our identity with things like anxieties and fears and worries, because those are all rooted in your identity. So they can be super helpful in that way. And even just incorporating a microdose here and there can help you see things a little bit differently. And the benefit is that while the experience is even on a high dose may only last six hours or so, or four hours, six hours, the, the things you realize in the way you see the world sticks with you, it, it stays yeah. with you 
long after that. So it, they're just, yeah, they can yeah. be super helpful. <laughs> and that, never that's more or less why. Yeah. <laughs> but no, on that topic of, of it sticking with you, I read the how to change your mind by Michael Pollan, which is incredible read. And he talked about the idea of people. They had people hooked up to brain scans and they had experienced meditators. They had people who took psychedelics. They had all different types of people. And what they found was that people in the brain scan, when they were thinking about their psychedelic experience was similar to people entering deep meditations. And it's like, that's a wild realization that just thinking about it is shown to, to help actually be in that place, which yeah. was wild to me. Yeah. Yeah. I actually haven't read, I think I read the, uh, the Blinkist, which is like summary of books of how to change your mind. I haven't read the that's, whole thing. Is that I the just, TikTok version? The Blinkist, uh, like pr- the summary? Pretty, pretty much. Yeah. I think they're like 15 minute, 20 minute summaries. Um, cause I've listened to a lot of, I've, I've seen some of my like Michael Pollan's interviews or like podcast appearances and things like that. And he's a super interesting guy. And, and especially last fall when I was like deep into just researching psychedelics for like a month before I tried them, I was just like enthralled with all of it. Um, and so people like Paul Stamets and Michael Pollan yeah. and lots of other people that I can't think of right now have talked a lot about them and just all of the benefits and so yeah, it's fascinating just how interconnected those types of experiences, because they have so many stigmas for most of society that they're just because they're a schedule one drug. And it's like, meanwhile, we have alcohol and cocaine running rampant. And those are like, so obviously two of the worst drugs on the face of the earth. And then people are like, dude, you take mushrooms too much. And it's like, you're blacking out, you know, twice a week, like chill out, <laughs> don't <laughs> quit your, quit your judgments, get off your high horse. But uh, it's interesting how interconnected things like meditation and psychedelics are because it all comes back to the sense of self and being able to recognize that, you know, you're not what you think you are, that those thoughts are just appearing in consciousness, but you don't have to cling to all of them. You don't have to take all of them so seriously. And something like mushrooms can just accelerate that because it helps downregulate that default mode network that is the root of all of the, the things you're worried about and afraid of is that sense of self. Why do you think that it seems like more and more people are coming to realizations like this and at younger ages and, and psychedelics pushing their way slowly to the mainstream? Like it just outside looking in, it, it looks like a movement of awakening or a movement of just more people being open to concepts like this. What, yeah. Why do you think that's occurring? I think there's a ton of different aspects of it. And there's so many different things that are sort of coming to fruition now. And I think it's, it's like almost balanced on both sides as we have things like government controls, they're trying to restrict more and more at the same time we have, you know, the open internet and, and access to all this different information. We can actually like in the age of information now, like we, we couldn't, figure out all this stuff at the tip of our fingers. We couldn't even have this conversation via, you know, Riverside 30 years ago, not even, even 20, you know, 10 years, 20 ago. years ago, but yeah, you no, know, but it's, 10 it's years like, ago, we couldn't have this quality on Riverside on both. Of absolutely. Our yeah. Which is insane. And so all of these things are sort of coming to a head, things like cryptocurrency. Like if, if with Bitcoin, if Bitcoin, you know, I'm super into Bitcoin, but it, if that becomes the world reserve currency, like we don't need the Fed. We don't need the government controlling our monetary supply anymore. So all of these things are like bringing about all of these freedoms because there isn't, I think it's like there isn't as much external danger in the world as there was. And for so long, we relied upon all of these societal structures to help us feel better. And it's like, oh, you know, big government is here to help you. And it's like, now we're like, oh, maybe, you know, people are just questioning it. And as we question things, because we have access to information and it's not just like, you know, two news channels on the seven o'clock, 7 PM news, it's like, that is all people used to get any of their information from. So it's like, no wonder everyone had very similar views because they're just getting infiltrated with whatever people tell them is the way, but now people can do things on their own and figure things out 
on their own. And as they do, they, they see things a little bit more clearly. And we have, you know, a, a re-emergence of psychedelics and the open internet and cryptocurrency, Bitcoin stuff. And it's all just at the same time, we have all of these like government controls of people trying in power, trying to keep that power, but it's like, it comes back to the people and how the people respond. And that will inevitably always pull through whether it takes, you know, 20 years or 200 years, who's to say, but it's happening. And I think, so there's a ton of different things that are, that are leading to it and causing it and being impacted by it all simultaneously. Um, and I'm, I'm, excited for it excited to see it play out <laughs> yeah absolutely I, I love this tweet you had which summarized what you just said so perfectly which is two similarities i see between mushrooms and bitcoin most people who are against them either a haven't done very much research on them or b are hugely benefiting from our current system that restricts freedom be it freedom of choice thought expression or money and I, I kind of like how you point, painted it here because it's like it's either out of ignorance or it's out of malice. And like there are people acting in both ways, some out of ignorance, some out of malice. But like it's it was a recognition of both truths. And I, I enjoyed that way you framed it like that. Yeah, I appreciate it. And it's been interesting seeing those two things and just like the interconnectedness kind of like, you know, the question you just asked before about what's causing all this. And it's like it's all causing itself it's all happening and and it's like we'll see where it goes but it's like as above so below like as we change individually as and more clearly recognize that we are the world you know the world changes as you change the world changes as anyone individual human listening to this changes the entire world changes it's not just a piece of the world the whole world and we have ripples and impacts that we create every single moment that we are not even aware of. And it's not, it's almost not even the impact that's the most important, but it's the creation of it and the continued process of creating those ripples either, you know, towards ourselves or away from ourselves. And as we come closer to the recognition of ourselves and what we truly are, I think everything else will play out accordingly. Hmm. So what practical steps can we give people or practice or practices to help get them closer to themselves? Absolutely. I think um, recognizing that you're not what you think you are and questioning, even just right now, most people have an idea of something that they are. They think they are, you know, an angry person or an overthinker or a worried person, or they, they la have labeled themselves and they repeatedly call themselves, whether it's it's probably not out loud. Most people don't talk to themselves out loud. It's just internal, which is like really similar things. So it's like we label people who say it out loud as crazy, but like we're all talking to ourselves inside. So just recognizing that any of those things that you think you are is not what you are and actually clearly seeing that, no, you're not an overthinker. And it comes back to the recognition that you are right now because we build up this idea of ourselves based on our past because we have thought about something for a long time in the past, we now label ourselves as an overthinker. But by labeling ourselves as an overthinker, it is impacting our ability to experience right now beyond identity and beyond labels. So just recognizing that you are not that, you are not an angry person. You just have the capacity and the potential, the infinite potential within infinite potential to be angry, to feel anger within the infinite potential, you have the potential to overthink a little bit or to worry. Yes, they are all potentials. You also have the potential to act out of love and kindness and not worry and be super confident about something. Like those are all within the potentials too. But as you cling so tightly to this label, because although it's a, you know, quote unquote negative label, you find a sense of security in knowing what you are as opposed to being uncertain about what you could possibly be. So relaxing into the uncertainty of what you are and the uncertainty of everything moving beyond right now, everything beyond this moment here and now is completely uncertain, which freaks the fuck out of people most of the time, but that is reality. So as you cling to things like control, 
it's a false sense of control, a false sense of security always. So inevitably, there's going to be times when you feel like you're losing that control. And that's when things like anxiety and, and fear tend to arise. But if you can just recognize from the beginning that everything beyond this moment is completely uncertain, there is no control over what's actually going to happen. You do have influence here and now, but only ever here and now. So I don't want to discount that. But everything beyond this moment is uncertain. If you can relax into that, then as uncertain things start to unfold, you'll be like, oh, this is exactly how I expected. And that's okay. And the only constant is change. The only certainty is uncertainty. So as you can see that and practice that, it will just bring about so much more faith in yourself and so much more peace in your day-to-day -day experience. Andrew, I think that's a beautiful place to come to a close for hopefully the first part of uh, many talks like this and many more conversations. I'm so grateful for your ability to communicate and your desire to actually put yourself out there because there's a lot of people that might have these thoughts um, and have these ideas, but the fact that you actually would be willing to put yourself in the arena to be judged on these thoughts and to experience what it will feel like to get the hate back and all that. It's like, it takes a special person and it's, it's not that serious, but it, it is really appreciated from one content creator, one person to the other. But, uh, thank you, man. Thank you for coming on here today and ex exploring your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Danny. Really appreciate it. Those are some super kind words. And I'm, I'm very grateful for just having the opportunity to express this stuff and for all the awesome questions that you asked and like obviously did your research and that's greatly appreciated. And, and I had a great time chatting with you and I hope everyone enjoyed the conversation as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. Same here. And uh, where can we send people to connect with you further? What's the best place? Uh, yeah, I'm on pretty much all the platforms. My podcast is called Dualist Unity. That's on every podcast platform and YouTube. Uh, TikTok is not Andrew Murnane. Uh, Instagram is a dot Uh, Twitter, Andrew underscore Murnane. I have my own YouTube also, but you can just click the link in my bio and, and pretty much find any of my other stuff in any of those platforms. Was the not Andrew Murnane, was that your original username or was that something you changed after the fact? Yeah, no, I, I changed that about two or three months ago. I was oh, like, let's really? give this a shot for a little bit. And then I was like, oh, this is, I'm sticking with this. Um, but yeah, it, it's funny though, cause my bio has always been, who am I, who are you? And mm. that was like from the first week the that jump. I had a TikTok when I had like 10 people following. Cause I was like, it's kind of funny. Cause it's like people come to someone's bio to figure out who they are. And it's just become like more and more like, wow, this actually has made a lot of sense the entire time. Cause it's like, who am I? I don't know. I, I never know uncertainty. It, it brings back to that, but it's, so it's kind of funny that it's, it's always been that way and it always will be. I'm sure. <laughs> so epic. Oh man. I, I appreciate you so much. I can't wait for the day. Hopefully we can do this in person and, uh, yeah, follow this man everywhere because the wisdom is incredible. Awesome. Appreciate it, Danny.